Have you ever heard the story about the billionaire who was desperately trying to find a perfect young man who would be honorable and, and love his daughter and marry her as she was his only child? He was worth billions, though. And so what he decided to do is he, he asked some of the most eligible men of, from all around the country, from all around the world, really, to come to his mansion. And in his mansion, at, at his backyard party, he would figure out a way to find the perfect, brave, fearless man to marry his daughter, his prized daughter. And so he took his Olympic-sized swimming pool in his backyard, and he filled it with some of the most dangerous of creatures, piranhas and barracudas and, and sharks and, and you name it, uh, alligators and crocodiles and all kinds of scary things. And as he stood there before these young men, he said, Men, I have a proposition to make you. Today I'm going to offer to the person who swims across, first swims across this pool, I'm going to offer you a one-time deal to be able to get one of three different things so you need to choose wisely. You can, first of all, you can choose to take $100 million. And then you could hear the crowd go, wow. He said, or you can choose to be a chief executive officer in my corporation and be guaranteed that you'll never be fired, you'll never be replaced, and you'll always be guaranteed to be one of the top people in my corporation. And the Oz went again. Or he said, number three, you can marry you can marry my only daughter, and with that, you will be named as the sole beneficiary to everything I own, everything I have, all the billions and billions of dollars if you live and become her uh, husband for the rest of your life. And as he was finishing saying this, there was a huge splash on the other end of the pool, and everybody's attention turned from the, the billionaire to what was going on in the pool. There was a young man who had gotten into the pool, and he was swimming violently. In fact, he was swimming so hard, so fast, it was amazing. He was swimming faster than any Olympic swimmer had ever swum. He, he was swimming so fast that he was out swimming sharks, and he was out sh swimming everything dangerous in there. And he jumped out of the pool as quickly as he can at the other end. And the billionaire ran over to meet this young man, and he said, Son... Son, I can't believe how courageous you are. You, you, you didn't even give me a time to really almost finish what I was saying. So what would you like? And he began to ask the young man. He said, son, is it the $100 million? Would you like to have the $100 million? <laughs> and the young man who had, who had been swimming as hard as anyone has ever uh, swam before in his life, he couldn't really get the words out, but he shook his head no, trying once again to grasp for air. With that, the billionaire smiled a little bit bigger and he said, well, then I imagine you'll probably want to be one of the CEOs of my corporation and, and be guaranteed a, a spot for the rest of your life with a huge salary. And with that, the young man still having a hard time to, uh, breathing, couldn't answer, but he shook his head no once again. The smile got bigger on the billionaire and he said, well, then you've made me the happiest father in all the world because you must want to marry my daughter and therefore become the heir to my billions as long as you love her for all of her life. <laughs> and the young man still, still having a hard time breathing. He was doubled over and he put his hand up and he sort of waved it at the man, no. He shook his head, no. To which the puzzled billionaire looked at him and said, well, son, what is it that you want? And with that, the young man mustered enough breath to look up and say, I just want to know the name of the guy who pushed me into the pool. Hi, I'm Pastor Bill with your Maple Minute for Thursday, July the 30th, 2020. You know, that's a silly story, but sometimes that's how life feels, doesn't it? We have to face, because somebody else pushed us, our fears. And that really does really have a, 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 a devastating effect on our lives. I think as we look into the life as we did the other day of David, we see David, a guy who... I don't believe was fearless, but he knew how to overcome his greatest fears in life. And when you look at it, he wrote this Psalm 23, a psalm that uh, so often we look at in funeral times, but I don't believe David wrote it as a funeral psalm. I believe David wrote it as his, uh, as his anthem to live a life of fearlessness for God. Let's look at it. It says there in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. What a profound statement. 
He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the, path, the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David, in his, in his conquest of life, in his living daily in the pre presence and pleasure of God's, uh, God's spirit, had a heart for God. And I believe David in Psalm 23 epitomizes what it would look like to live a life without fear. I think about David's greatest challenge that we, we always note and talk about in his life may have been that challenge to take on Goliath there in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And David, as we look at his life, overcame fear that honestly... The rest of Israel couldn't. I want to remind you of the story and take time in your devotional life to read back over the story. But what you find is that the children of Israel, their army, under the leadership of their king, the tallest man in all of Israel, a guy who was head and shoulders above everyone else, a guy named Saul, had taken up a position on one side of a valley, and on the other side of the valley were the Philistines, their dreaded enemies, their arch rivals. And the Philistines had a giant who was nine and a half foot tall, a guy named Goliath, who had come out every day for uh, over a month now, and he had blasphemed God, he had cursed God, he had challenged the, uh, the army of Israel to send out their best to fight against him. And simply stated, we should automatically think that God's chosen king, a guy who stands head and shoulders above everybody else, the main leader, would take on that challenge to uphold God's character and he'd march himself out there for the sake of God and his people. But he didn't. David, a young teenage boy, a redhead, ruddy boy who, who wasn't really even thought highly enough to do much more than watch sheep. David is the one who goes out for God's sake and overcomes the fear that was gripping all the nation of Israel. You see, David had older brothers who were in the army of Israel. And they were doing the same thing that most, uh, most of us do every Sunday. They were getting together, they were standing up, they were saying the praises of God, they were wearing their shiny armor, but they weren't doing anything to attack the enemy. They weren't doing anything to overcome their fears. And so often, that's what we do in our life. We come together on Sundays, and we get together, and we sing the songs of Zion, and we, we rattle the swords, and we, we, uh, we sh shake our shields, but we don't ever use them to face the fears of our life. David did, and David overcame Goliath, and that's something we know. And I want to just look at three things about how David overcame the greatest fear of his life in this brief time. First of all, we have to say this. In overcoming your greatest fear, David focused on the goal of protecting his nation. See, when David got there, everybody else was worried about themselves. That's why they didn't want to go out and challenge Goliath. King Saul was worried about what he'd look like if he marched out and was defeated by, by the giant Goliath. But David, a young boy... He stood up and he said, as was noted so often, he said, is there not a cause? He couldn't stand the fact that Israel was being uh, shamed and their God was being blasphemed. And David was encouraged to, to take uh, a chance in his life to go stand up to the greatest fear that anyone had ever known, the fear of losing to this giant, Goliath, because he knew that it was not about him as much as it was about God and God's people. He focused on the goal of protecting his nation. You have to wonder, why was it, the king, why was it that the king, a man who was somewhat experienced, a man who was in charge, a man who was physically well, well endowed, he stood head and shoulders above everyone else, why didn't he go out to the giant? Because he was focused on the goal of protecting himself. It was about others is what David understood. It was about God. He wanted to protect God's reputation, protect God's name, do what God wanted him to do, not sit around and, and worry about what it would cost him. David, I believe, when he went out to meet Goliath, was okay if he had lost his life that day. And, and that's something strange because we don't think about it, but I believe David was okay. I believe David didn't think he would lose his life because he knew God was with him. But David didn't have the fear that most, gripped most of the men, including his own brothers, because David focused on the goal of honoring God. Number two, I would say this, in overcoming your greatest fear, 
we find that David believed in the call of God upon his life. David had already been anointed to be the next king of Israel, but he was still a young man. But what David understood in his life was the calling of God on his life. When he goes into the tent and talks to Saul about taking on Goliath, Saul sort of tries to dissuade him, but Saul really is more concerned about his own personal calling, his own personal safety. His cowardice really overcomes what, what should have been leadership. And so Saul, this great tall man, he says, okay, well, I'll put the nation at risk. I'll put everything at risk and send out a teenage boy, but here, wear my armor, take my sword. And David, David really, he tried to, to, to accommodate, but when it comes down to it, David said, I can't use things I don't know about. David knew the call of God in his life, so David looks at Saul and says, hey, you know what, Saul? There was a time when a lion came. There was a time when a bear came, and they came and, and, and took sheep, and you know what I did? I faced that bear, I faced that lion, and I took him down. And Goliath, the greatest fear in your life, the greatest fear in anybody's life, Goliath is no different because I have God on my side. And so David believed in the call of God upon his life. Number three, I would say this. Overcoming your greatest fear uh, simply should be like this. David had the right expectation of personal reward for doing the right thing. <laughs> David went out to face Goliath, not expecting really too much in return. David didn't go out there seeking to be all of a sudden made king. David didn't want to be all those things. Of course, there were some rewards to getting these things. David was promised the hand of Saul's daughter. He was promised some financial uh, re, uh, re, uh, remuneration. But I want you to know that David had the right expectation of personal reward for doing the right thing. See, David said, if no one else will, I will. If no one else will face the fear of Goliath, then I will face the fear of Goliath. And David went out and actually ran out to meet Goliath, this monster-sized giant. And this giant looks at him, laughs at him, and says, What am I, a dog that you sent this little boy to fight me? I'm a man of war from my youth, and here you are, you're, you're a little kid, you're, you're, you're an insect, you're nothing. And David looks at him and says, You come to me with swords and with shields and with spears, but all I'm coming to you with is God. Because he knew that call of God in his life, and he knew it was not about him. It was about the, the personal uh, need of his countrymates. And he knew that he had a right expectation of personal reward because he was doing the right thing. How do you overcome the, your greatest fear? I think you have to think about the same way. See, you won't overcome fear. I think, I think probably one of the saddest things in David's brother's life, years down the road, Years down the road, when David's on the throne, can you imagine his brothers as they sat around and they talked about that day that David took on the Goliath? They probably didn't talk about it the way David did. David probably told that story with such, uh, with such honesty and pride in what he had seen God do in his life. But imagine his brothers. His brothers had to sit back, and they were saddened because that was the day they didn't overcome their fear. They let somebody else face their fears. Are you facing your fears? I would encourage you this week, hey, you know what? Fear can make you stop in your tracks and not do the right thing. But you know what? Approach fear the right way. With God's help, you can overcome anything because God has called us to be overcomers. Be an overcomer. Don't let fear get the best of you.